to answer your question, Dan, I, I want to get back to, to something that actually matters. The, the people, the, the, ninety percent of the people watching this on television will never have heard of non-locality, and, and if, if we could explain it to them, they're not going to care about it. They're, they're worried about Jesus. They're worried about the collision with the Muslim world. Uh, they're worried about about uh, gay marriage. I mean, this, this is this is religion talk, and we're talking about the future of God now. That's if, the past of God. If, right? Okay, so. I'm happy to move on from that, but, but let's, let's first acknowledge that that's the context. That's why we're having this conversation. The, the reason why we're talking about God is for the last 4,000 years, people have been handing books to their children saying, all these other books were written by people, but this book is a magic book. It could not possibly have been written by a human being. Well, I think, and, and, and so now we're here talking about God and the future of God. So you think that's the past of God? And what is no, the, I, what is I the think future? we can comfortably say that what Sam is talking about, one reason we're having this conversation is that this conversation will lead to other conversations which can say, been there, done that. Let's move on. And the future of God is to understand how a new understanding of science, a new understanding of the perennial wisdom traditions, otherwise called woo-woo, actually can lead to more compassion, to more love, to more kindness, to more tolerance, to more peace to more insight, to more inspiration, to more creativity. So we become the conscious beings through which the universe will take its le next leap in evolution. What's That's the future. What's that, what sounds so bad about that future? Well, but uh, all of that is good. You should be doing those things anyway, whether or not there's a God or a great spirit or a non-locality. <laughs> you know, and related to that, and, and that's a, you know, a very good point, of point but the, what we find is that I tends to, I attends, tends to tend to thou more than I attends to it. And it's just, it's that whole question of having that personal I-thou relationship. I once studied with Martin Buber, who was, a, by, by the way, this tall and his beard was that long. And uh, he, you know, he, he talked about this sense of personal relationship being dynamic in the, in the spiritual experience. Now, at the same time, what we find, it's fascinating, we are living in the time in which we sit, zazen, we, uh, you know, we, we flirt with uh, uh, Sufism and Buddhism and its many, many different ideologies. And is this cafeteria religion or is it people finding in the great repast of spiritual knowings, the wisdom traditions of many places, finding their own place, slowly but surely, in their own spiritual life. Okay, but Gene, Gene, so th that scheme, I, I, agree, I agree with you about that scheme. There are many people having these remarkable experiences in every traditional context. That, in and of itself, proves that all of these religions are wrong. Oh, all, all how of these, is that? All of these religions <laughs> claim very funny. their exclusive validity. And the fact that you have Christians having deep experiences of peace, and you have Muslims, and you have atheists, and you have Buddhists, it proves that there's a deeper principle that should be talked about in a non-sectarian way that is not held hostage by Iron Age, age literature. I mean, that... Okay, so... so well, we, no, we no, 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 that's a very important point. We and need I a think scientific I... discourse on the possibilities of human well-being. Sure. And, and, and you can get as... as as esoteric as you want there. You can talk about self-transcendence. You can talk about the ego being an illusion. You can ask, what is the relationship between consciousness and the rest of the physical world? And the truth is, when you get out to some of those fringe areas, you are getting to an area of real scientific ignorance. Uh, and the first thing you want to do in the spirit of intellectual honesty is admit ignorance, not claim that you, by closing your eyes, can realize your identity with the entire cosmos and, and you, the origin of the, uh, you go get before the Big Bang with your, your, your unguarded intuitions. I mean, that's just not, that's not how you discover what happened. And it's also who you and I have been talking to, you know, who will give very different perspectives on this. I think the, the big issue here in the future of God is that the reset button of history has been hit and that we are in times such as we have never had before. And that in such times, I, I am finding people moving to a sense of radical empathy, not just with others 
sensibilities and points of view, without which we will perish, you see, and you take a very different point of view, but that we are also, I think, expanding our sensibility of what we have called transcendence, grace, love, compassion. And as we do this, I think that there is being created in the world and time today a very unique and emergent spirituality and with it a new story. I mean, that's what I have to hold to in the work that I do around the world, that there's a new story. I mean, let's take myth, myth, for example. Now, I use myth different, differently than superstition. I think that a myth is something that never was, but is always happening. It's almost like the coded DNA of the human mind-brain system. And I travel to countries where I see the stories changing. As, for example, I was in India, and uh, they were showing that great, great, the Ramayana about, uh, you know, it's the great core story of India. And as we watched, the people came in, they tied up their water buffalo, they sat down, and here was the story of Rama and Sita and Sita being rescued. And the old Brahmin lady sitting next to me, she said, oh, I don't like Princess Sita, she's much too passive. We women in India, we're much stronger than that. We have to change the story. And I said, madam, the story is at least 3,000 years old. She said, all the more reason why we have to change it. My name, my name is Sita, my husband's name is Rama. He's a lazy bun, anything happened, I'd have to rescue him. And I was watching the changing of the story in its mythic structure. The story is moving, I believe, from my experience around the world. I think it's moving to men and women together as part of the heroic journey. I think it's moving to people in many, many different cultures. And it is about the saving, if you will, of this beautiful planet in this, its most critical moment in human history. And that's the new story. Jean, you, you know that, the, that nowhere in human discourse is there a greater impediment to changing the story than in religion. I mean, the, the story doesn't change. The Ramayana is not going to get rewritten based You're on that conversation. You're talking about cultural mythology, not religion. I, I'm talking, not the I, religious I'm talking experience. about the Bible, the Quran. That's all, all cultural the orga- mythology. The, the organizing doctrines by which 99% of the people on earth who call themselves religious Still are, the past. Are Still the past. Life. We have the internet. We have ABC News. We can change that conversation. Yeah, I, I, that, that, that is the purpose of conversations like this. But it seems to me that if you the moment you... If you want to move forward and reinvent God and actually have it be relevant to people and have your word God, I mean, I don't know why you'd be tempted to use the word God. If in Generation, fact you don't, you organization, don't be, delivery. Please. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, it seems to me that you are, you are uh, happily being misunderstood in your use of the word God. Uh, you know... That actually sad. That, va- that vast numbers of people care about God for a multiplicity of reasons, mo- most of which you don't want to defend on this stage. But why use the word God? Why not just talk about I just told you it's an acronym. No. Deepak. Well, <laughs> well yeah, I have to say, sorry for being so combative. That was because of Michael Sharma, but I actually agree. <laughs> I, actually, I actually agree with almost everything you've said. Sam, I have no disagreement with the deeper truth that you are hinting at. I am just saying is that this conversation needs to take place in a setting such as this where it can lead to other conversations so that this is not a debate but a dialectic where through these contradictory points of view we arrive at a greater truth. Okay. But, but, you... You are carrying around a tremendous amount of ballast from the past, and you, and you are t- describing it as somehow necessary equipment. So, for instance, you talked about these great wisdom traditions that, that he is so callously dismissed out of his own ignorance. You go to these great wisdom Thank traditions, you. right? <laughs> and, you can so, I mean, so the, and you're talking about changing the story. And, and so t- what does it mean to change the story in Islam? Let's just talk about facts. You open the Quran. In the fourth chapter, it says disobedient wives should be whipped by their husbands. Okay, so this is what... This it says is, that in the Old Testament, all kinds I, of things. I, I, it says it that absolutely in does. the I'm, Hindu I'm, book I'm, of... I'm just, uh, Deepak, I'm just picking Islam as an example. It, why? It's true of all religions. Okay, then I can pick Judaism. Would, would you be more comfortable if I picked Judaism as an example? It's the same... Yes, all of these books are, are, are litanies of barbarous practices. But the, the point is that what is, the way Muslims are now constrained to change the story is they have to, they can't change the Quran. The Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. They have to parse the word whipped 
And the most enlightened of them have to say things like, well, it doesn't actually mean you take out the bull whip and you whip her. It could be a kind of a ceremonial kind of a padding. <laughs> you know, just a, chast a brief chastisement that doesn't actually hurt. And so you get a range, but nowhere in that range do you get real equity and real compassion and real understanding between the sexes. And that's, to get that, you have to admit, okay, this is barbarous nonsense that we, we should just disregard. And, and religion doesn't give you the tools to do that. And God talk doesn't, is either profoundly misleading or unhelpful, or it's just part of the problem. So in, to your mind, to your minds, is there any future of God that you could be comfortable with? Um, a God, say, defined the way Deepak defines it. Well, it's, I mean, so he's sort of redefining it in his own particular way, in which everybody would have to agree. And then, I guess my point is, why hinge it to all the, the well, the woo-woo stuff? Why hinge it to things that are just fuzzy words? We can actually get right down to understanding what's going on with things like compassion science, and emotion. Science does not explain why we're here. It doesn't answer a lot of the big questions. Oh, okay, but that doesn't mean it... It doesn't mean that we can't at least try to understand. I mean, the whole point of science is to try to get down and drill in and figure out what's going on. So we can use words like, it'd be better if we were all compassionate and loving to one another and so on. Of course, who would disagree? But what we want to know as scientists is, well, how do you actually implement that? What, what are the sorts of things we can do that increase that in people? Well, we have to understand what's going on when somebody has affections for somebody else. So, for example... Uh, if you have an exchange with a, another human, a stranger, in which you give them something and they give you something back and it's a positive thing, there's a little spike in oxytocin. Oxytocin is an attachment hormone uh, discovered with nursing mothers and then expanded to it. Looks, it turns out any time you touch somebody else, there's a little oxytocin there. So anything we can do to increase oxytocin is a good thing, and that makes people like each other. So there, I've not taken anything away from the beauty of love and the emotional appreciation, but we now have an understanding of the mechanics of it, and therefore you can structure some kind of social system in which there's more of that, not, not spraying it in the air, but, but actually having people exchange uh, things in a positive way, like trade, uh, makes, it increases oxytocin, and there's nothing wrong with knowing that. It doesn't take anything away from the story. I'm not sure how I know this, I but I think Deepak wants to say yeah. something. Oxytocin is not love. Oxytocin is the measurement of love in a laboratory. No. Just like you're H2O, no, no. knowing the formula H2O is not the experience of water. Deepak, okay? this experiment so, has been run. Right? I know it has been no, run. No, what does it prove, no, the though? The control is that you give oxytocin to people and then they become. Because more both oxytocin and the, the experience of, of love are interdependent. Th this is semantic. It's not a cause, yeah. causal relationship, it, it is, is not the same it thing as cause. correlation. Deepak, you know? there, there are different levels if of If I go to a picnic ourselves. and there are ants all the time, that doesn't mean ants cause the picnic. Okay, let me just explain the experiment. <laughs> so. Two people in a game system. I know the experiment, yeah, but Michael. But wait, wait, I have to say it. Two people this is the kind of woo-woo you exact. guys promote no, 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 to no. prove is, your yeah, so-called science. I don't know the experiment. A, a controlled so let experiment. The experiment. Yeah, let me tell you. Okay. okay, so you, you have two people in an exchange game, and they make an offer to each other. And if it's fairly equitable and generous, they feel good about each other. You draw their blood, and there's a spike in oxytocin. Now, is that because oxytocin is the result of the positive interaction, or is it the cause? So the control was you give them a little, before the experiment, you give them a little hit of oxytocin with nose spray. It's done to induce labor in pregnant women. And Paul Zak did this research, and sure enough, any subjects that got a, a, spike, got a spike in oxytocin from the nose spray were more generous than those that didn't get the spike. But if it's I, cause, if I said, I love you, and it meant something to you, you would also release oxytocin. Yeah. So does the thought create the molecule, or the molecule create the thought? Are, are they simultaneous expressions of a deeper, transcendent reality that we are inseparable? Ask him. Can, can, I, can I just jump in here? Uh, okay, well, you, I think we should wander off the, the, uh, the specifics of oxytocin. You, you, he's just described an experiment where you can actually answer that question. If I give you a shot of oxytocin and it changes your level of trust, then, the, then the, it's not just mere correlation. I mean, we've run, the, we've run it both ways. So but that's I what can he just increase trust and it can generate yeah, oxytocin yes, okay. too. But, but if trust is just the brain in one state, 
then you have the brain influencing its future states. You haven't gotten out of the brain and gotten an, an, an